Good morning, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the conference. Um, welcome to this keynote session for SITSAI Oz 21. I'm Lisa Evans. I'm a committee member for AXA and also the AXA WA chapter, and I'm a citizen science coordinator. I'm speaking today from Perth or Bulu on Wajak Noongar Buja. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and of all the places we're joining from today and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I'd also like to thank our platinum sponsor, Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, I'd just like to remind everyone before we start about our Miro board for climate change ideas. Uh, it's linked in the top part of the conference portal. So if you're having trouble finding it, um, we'd really love it for everyone to let us know what their thoughts and ideas and hopes and wishes and fears are ahead of the COP meeting coming up next month in Glasgow, as we know that this is very important to our community. Um, also, if you have any questions for Dr. Foley, please do put them in the live Q&A function so we can see them easily. Um, we have a tradition at AXA conferences of having Australia's chief scientist deliver a keynote, and we're very honoured that Dr. Kathy Foley has agreed to continue this today. Um, on a personal note, as a woman who studied physics myself in the 90s, the representation of women in physics was still very low, and I began a lifelong habit that whenever I heard of a woman physicist, I always went and looked up everything she'd done and drew great inspiration from her achievements. So I'm very pleased to tell you about Dr. Foley today. Uh, Dr. Cathy Foley, AO, PSM, commenced as Australia's ninth chief in January 2021 after an extensive career at Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO. Dr. Foley is an internationally recognised physicist with major research achievements in superconductors and sensors, which led to the development of the LANTEM sensor system to locate valuable deposits of minerals deep underground, resulting in discoveries and delineation of minerals worth more than $6 billion. Dr. Foley's scientific excellence and influential leadership have been recognised with numerous awards and fellowships, including election to the Australian Academy of Science in 2020, along with an Order of Australia for Service to Research Science and to the Advancement of Women in Physics. She's also a Fellow of Australian Academy of Technological Science and Engineering 2008 and an Honorary Fellow of Australian Institute of Physics 2019. Dr. Foley is an inspiration to women in STEM across the globe and is committed to tackling gender equality and diversity in the science sector to embrace the full human potential of all. So I'll hand you over now to Dr. Kathy Foley. Thanks, Lisa. What a lovely introduction. And it's so great to know you're a fellow physicist. Well, I'm uh, coming to you from the uh, traditional lands of the Camaragal people up in the northern part of Sydney near Karingai National Park. And I pay my respects to them and to traditional custodians of other lands where you, the audience members, are based. And I acknowledge elders who are caring for those lands. And I pay my respects to who will follow. Well, I want to talk to you about my vision for citizen science because I think this is a, such a critical part of what I call the science sector or the research sector. And I thought to kick it off, I might start by uh, my own career. And the reason is that I've noticed a lot of people have their rationale for why they get involved with STEM is because of the way they think about science in general. And for me, science in any form has always been about making a difference. And this goes right back to when I was in school. I have to say, I came from a, a Catholic background. I was came, came from a family where my parents were professionals and I never wanted for anything, so I am very privileged. And uh, I also had this ex expectation that with that privilege came a need to make a contribution. So I wanted to save the world and make a difference. So that started pretty early on in life. Initially, when I was in high school, I wasn't really, I loved science and I loved uh, the world around me. I used to enter into science teachers association competitions. But what I wanted to do was see how I could improve the world in some way. And in that, I was very aware of uh, the issues. This is in, I finished high school in 1975, so quite a few years ago. Uh, but I thought if it would be great to work with Indigenous people. And so uh, after high school, I went up to Burke and worked there for a short time to, to see if there was some way to improve things and work on the injustices there. And I ran a little preschool. You can see a picture of me there with my pigtails. But I 
learned something really important and that is I wanted to make an impact on the bigger system not just the one-to-one -one, which I don't want to underestimate the incredible importance of the one-to-one -one, but I, I guess I get a bit impatient with that because if something's not right I like to get in there and change the system and I suppose that's been a bit of a way I've operated all my life because originally I was going to be a high school science teacher and I uh, go, going to Macquarie University in Sydney was exposed to science in a way which I hadn't at high school. I met something, a professional scientist for the first time and loved the idea of research and experimentation. So I've had the most amazing career where I've gone from being a somewhat dyslexic child or very dyslexic child at school. And there is a picture of me in primary school looking all pretty messy. Actually, I'm not big on, uh, on grooming. You can probably still see that's the case. And I, um, I went through though and loved maths and science and uh, and entered into university, did a Bachelor of Science degree, a university lecturer uh, from first year biology really encouraged me to go on and do an honours degree, which I did do, and uh, win a scholarship, do a postgraduate um, PhD. And then I uh, was lucky enough to first of all have a short term job in CSRO which eventually I was able to apply for an ongoing role and was at CSIRO for 36 years. And during that time, I was able to have a family. I was able to be involved in outreach. So there's some pictures of me speaking on radio at an event for National Science Week. I developed devices that were able to detect small magnetic fields, like the ones that come from your brain or your heart. And, uh, and these could be used for mineral exploration both on the ground and in the air. And you can see a picture of me on a tarmac measuring the magnetic fields around an airport to see how well our systems would work in a, in a very noisy magnetic environment. And then eventually uh, I, um, I went through different roles while I was in CSIRO. I had 20 different roles in the time I was there, eventually becoming CSIRO's chief scientist, where it gave me a bit of a feeling for how I could really have an impact on the world. And so last year, it was an incredible opportunity and honour to be named Australia's Chief Scientist, which I've almost finished my first year. I've got two more months until the end of my first of three years. And it's been an extraordinary honour and, and a great ability to uh, look at how I can work with the research sector. Because as Australia's Chief Scientist, I think a big part of my role is promoting science to Australians and promoting Australian science in general here and overseas. And citizen science is one of the best examples of where this is working. We have Australians who are science interested and engaged working in citizen science outside their formal professions. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. And I see it as part of my duties to make sure that the work I do as chief scientist benefits the citizen science sector, as well as other science streams and science policy. We know that citizen scientists undertake a huge range of tasks. And here's a chart that goes through uh, showing where different uh, tasks are undertaken by, by those of you who are our citizen science army. And that is uh, from, you know, the biggest one is, of course, species observation. And what would we do without our, our mobile phones? Because they really do allow us to be able to have a really complex instrument that has, is able to detect place, time, detailed, high quality photography and be able to collect data from anywhere, which is so amazing. All the way down to data tagging, sample analysis, transcription, even uh, having in some cases, I know with um, work that's done in some countries on SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, people are, are using their computers to be part of a worldwide network to use downtime to be able to analyze data. They, but there, in, there are things I think that are less tangible that are done by citizen scientists, but just as important. So for example, you engage in our community and you inspire our youth, which is incredibly critical. And also you influence our policymakers from the grassroots. So when I think about it, it's actually a bit like what my job's all about. And here's all the different things. So inspire, engage and influence are the things that are absolutely critical for citizen science. So I thought I'd highlight a couple of my key work streams this year, and I want to see how I can tie them into the citizen science priorities and projects across the country. 
And the three things I want to talk about today is uh, the work I'm doing on open access and the ability for technology accessibility. And then I want to finish off with career pathways. So let's start with open access. It has been a bit of an elephant in the room. Australia does great research. But for those outside of the formal science system, it's actually hard to access the results because they're hidden behind paywalls. It's a barrier to citizen science and to science and innovation throughout the Australian ecosystem. And one of my key goals is to see this scientific excellence become available to every Australian living here or in the country. So why, how does it work? Well, let's start at the beginning. Australian governments, both state and federally, invest some $12 billion in research science and innovation. That was just last year. But the outcomes of that research are hidden behind a paywall if you want to read it. And, uh, and that's a, a accessed by either going through things such as um, peer-reviewed journals, which are the main part of it. So the peer review system is how we write up the research and then it's picked up by scientific or we submit it to scientific journals. It's then uh, reviewed by others who we don't know about. It's a blind process. Uh, but they're experts in the field and that that virtuous cycle of them giving feedback, improving the work and getting to a point where we think it is as best as possible to be published. This is an absolutely critical part of the trust that we gain as researchers by going through this process. So what happens though is that where material is published in scientific journals by publishers, which are a range of different ones. There's a whole lot of them in Australia. We have 1500 different journal uh, 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 publishers, not just uh, journals, but publishers who are contributing or our researchers contribute their work to. And, uh, and they do provide important quality control of the scientific research. And it's really, and they also manage how that work is accessed. But they, for us to access it, and uh, we have to either pay uh, for a subscription, which most research organizations do, or if you're looking at paper by paper, and many of you might have seen that, it comes up saying, yes, you can read this beyond the abstract, but play, please pay you know, 10, 20, 30, $50. So this is something which I'd really like to see change. And, uh, and so one of the things which also is important is we've found that you can also pay an extra fee so that your material is open access to everyone. And so those, uh, and so what we've found is that if you have paid that extra fee, or and that your our material is open access, it's actually downloaded. That means it's read four times more often than those behind paywalls. And so that means it attracts more attention. But not only attracts more attention, it means it has greater influence and impact. So what's my plan? Well. There's a lot of money in the system with the Australian organisations who already pay for academic publishing access. That's our universities, libraries, state governments, public funded agencies such as CSIRO, ANSTO, um, and, uh, Geoscience Australia. And what I want to, what I have is envisaging a system where those funds could be available to a central implementation body, which then negotiates agreements for open access with all publishers and journals. In return, and facilitated by those agreements, my goal is for every person based in Australia to have access to all academic journals and for all Australian authored papers that are coming from the research based in Australia to be open access for the rest of the world to read. I want this to be an ongoing sustainable model with an ongoing funding stream. So this is a moving field. So I want you to watch this space. And why is this so important? This is because I believe research is our superpower and we have to release it to see the benefits. And we just heard today um, from Lisa saying, we want to hear about your ideas for ways to be able to address uh, climate. And, uh, and if you look at the release of the uh, report that came out, Australia's long-term emissions reduction plan in it, on page 15, there's a really important graph in there and it, it goes through looking at all the different things that are going to be take, taken under uh, to, to do the reductions. But there's one bit at the bottom which says further technology breakthroughs and that's 15% of the work that still needs to be done for us to reach uh, um, zero emissions by 2050. 
So this is something where I need you all to be thinking about that and research is our superpower to get us there. And also, I think the thing which I want to link back to is how important it is for young people to realise that they can access this information. And I can't help but uh, report here on Jonathan Davis, who's a Year 9 student who won the Eureka Prize for a Sleek Geats Award for his fantastic uh, video. Uh, and he um, said, as a quote here, I read a lot. When a concept grips me, I'll hunt it down. Do researching like they taught us in school make sure we use reliable sources. And this is something which is really critical because at the moment we can access freely through the internet a whole lot of stuff which we know is unreliable and is often confusing. We saw that happen with the COVID pandemic where uh, people were confused as to what to believe and weren't sure where the evidence came from. If Imagine what would happen if we were able to make research that is done all for, from all around the world accessible to everyone, from whether it's in industry, whether it's in government, whether it's in, um, in small to medium enterprises, whether it's professionals, or whether it's everyone in citizen science and the general public. Suddenly, we can make sure that we can use those reliable sources. So I'm keen to hear from you, because this is a big change, and I'm really uh, quite, being quite bold and ambitious here. And I, I want to hear from you as to whether open access is something you're interested in, whether you've got some ideas, some issues, concerns. So there's an, a, a website that you or an email account you can go to, openaccess at chiefscientist.gov.au, because I need your input as well. So let's look at my second area of focus, and that's building on the change underway in our research sector to build accessibility and remove obstacles to people engaging with our science research system. So let's think about how we do research. And, and I'm gonna say that it's already changing. So consider, for example, what in the recent past we did. A researcher generally works in a lab, uh, uses specialized equipment to conduct their own experiment collect their own data, analyze this data, and eventually write their own public research publication. Now, we saw last year with the thing over that it's been a catalyst for scientists and researchers to find new ways of working. And over the past year, there's been a rapid attitude shift towards working remotely that's created a whole lot of new options for scientific exploration. Instead of a scientist conducting all their research in a silo, they can now be collaborative and mobile by, access, by accessing the capability of others. For example, from home, they can send a request to a lab to make a sample uh, to another lab, uh, such as the synchrotron or microscopy, uh, uh, Australia or to the Opal reactor, so they can conduct their experiment. And that lab provides the data back to the researcher. And then they can go through and do their analysis and be able to dig out what the science is or the new information. And in time, automation is going to mean that the intensity of lab work is just going to be reduced anyway. So this opens up a whole new way of thinking of research. It doesn't matter where you are, so long as you've got a computer and an internet connection, you can be in remote regional New South Wales or Central Australia, and still, if you've got good internet connection, or you'll be able to access the whole of the research sector. So I see, as I see it, these changes are underway and it gives us major opportunities to redesign both the infrastructure and lab design, but also the role of the scientists. And I'm going to be a bit cheeky here and come up with what I, uh, I'm borrowing from, um, from the um, humanities, arts and social sciences. And that is, um, and I'm going to start off by explaining where this comes from. So I'm being quite intrigued by the concept of the conceptual artist. In fact, my youngest son is a conceptual artist. And what they do is they come up with an idea for an installation, and then they work with a whole range of different people to be able to build that installation. And this is a beautiful example here. This is uh, from uh, the artist who's a New York-based Chinese artist called uh, uh, Zhao, uh, I'm going to mess this up, but Zhao, Gao Chang, and they uh, and um, he developed and realised a spectacular meditative art installation called Heritage 2013, and uh, it took six years to build this up. And what you're seeing here is a beautiful, thought-provoking vision of our relationship with the earth and with each other, and it's a highly collaborative undertaking. 
and the artwork comprises of 99 life-sized imitation animals from around the world, congregating at a waterhole. And that waterhole covered um, over a thousand square meters on the floor space, huge. But to be able to manufacture this required a whole range of different artists, um, uh, technicians, uh, materials, uh, techniques, which was able to bring it all together. So it made me think, what if we were to redesign the researcher so we had the conceptual artist? So this would be where we can have our PC and our, our access to the cloud. We can access automated labs. We've got that connectivity, connectivity and collaboration. We're able to use our open access. We're able to use um, in infrastructure that's openly available through some of our national programs and then allow everyone to be, regardless of whether you're in a small to medium enterprise, whether you're a citizen scientist or someone living remotely, but being able to connect the whole research sector together. So infrastructure and lab design um, has previously been rather generational, uh, but we're seeing it become more agile with centralized systems and ecosystems run by experts with world-class equipment that's always up to date. And we've been really, I think, uh, very blessed in a country like Australia, where we've had very significant investment in very large uh, uh, scientific uh, and research equipment from whether it's supercomputers, such as the Pawsey supercomputer in Western Australia, through to radio telescopes, uh, such as we're seeing with the ASCAP in Western Australia, through to the synchrotron in Melbourne, uh, through to a whole range of things for data collection, and um, as well as the, the way of managing all that data. If we can master the changes of the way we want to get infrastructure to be set up, I see a future of much greater accessibility for science. Think of the famous worldwide science experiments like the human genome or the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array. What I see uh, these becoming uh, are, are something that is more common and more efficient and more incredible. And with greater technology in the palms of all our hands and a distributed citizen science network, we can, this can be a very big, valuable part of these kinds of efforts, like an amazing Atlas of Living Australia, which has shown us what is possible. And anyone who makes an observation can be part of citizen science. And it has been a lot of work trying uh, underway to understand how things like real-time analysis of social media could be used to predict instances such as um, something that's possibly going to happen today, a thunderstorm that impacts people's asthma. That, that way of putting information into, uh, into social media and being analysed by those who've got systems set up means that we could uh, actually have early indications of something happening. So we've got that real-time interface. And in fact, they've gone back looking at uh, some of the tweets and uh, social media that happened at the initial spread of COVID-19. And had we realised what was happening, we may have been able to contain it earlier. So as the Internet of Things becomes standardised, we can do more. And improved accessibility also means improvements in inclusivity. You don't need to be in a lab to do great science when you can send an experiment to be run off by a central lab. So regional and remote disability and other obstacles have the potential to be overcome. So now I want to look at then, having got us all working up and thinking what is possible, what about STEM career pathways? And the reason why I raise this is because this is where we need more people to consider this as a pathway for them. We know inspiring students to a career in STEM starts early. And there's a lot of components to that, from getting them interested to trying to showcase the absolute breadth of careers available. A career in STEM is more than just a researcher in a lab. You could work for industry or found your own uh, startup company. Or you could, go, like me, work in a publicly funded research agency such as CSIRO, or work in the public sector, which is what I'm now doing for the as a public servant. Citizen science has an is an amazing vehicle, which is already showcasing this breadth, and it's also inspiring too. So let's give an example here, which I've got on the on the slide. Consider the seeds in science, and you know the I love this. What will happen to wattle? It's a project that's currently underway, and it's sending wattle seeds that have spent time in the International Space Station out to schools across Australia to be grown alongside their earthbound brethren 
and be compared in a giant citizen science project. How fantastic is that? It's botany, space science, biology, and good hands-on observations, all wrapped up with conversations about space travel and space colonization. And it's just amazing how much good a single project like this can do. As I mentioned though, there are a number of future industries on the horizon where we really need to be building up the STEM workforce in Australia now. And I'll go through them. Hydrogen, which is gonna be critical for us. We're gonna be shipping our sunshine overseas as the newest clean renewable fuel. And that's already saying that in a few years time, it's gonna have 8,000 new jobs and probably more than that. And space, Australia's space agency, is uh, going from strength to strength and it's aiming to triple the size of the Australian space industry by 2030. And it thinks it will be by 2030, 20,000 new jobs, which is incredible. And artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is absolutely critical with uh, the way we want to have a digital economy in Australia and be able to operate in that remote way has been uh, identified to need 250,000 jobs in three years time. And then quantum, which is an area which I'm particularly interested in because that's my own research field. I see that as a huge potential emerging in Australia and it's here already. And we've identified that it will have at least 16,000 new jobs by 2040. And I think that's a serious understatement. But we know that STEM careers are a leaky pipeline. In 2016, there were nearly 1, 100, sorry, 170,000 STEM university graduates and, a half, uh, and about 400,000 STEM VET graduates that were not in the labor force. An amazing latent workforce. And, and half of them were younger than 65, which is a, you know, the average age of retirement, I guess. So effectively, we're losing STEM graduates when they wind up in non-STEM careers. And that's whether it's by choice or by the way things have happened. But nevertheless, we found out that in 2016, three in five workers with university engineering degrees were working in engineering jobs, which is great. But another one in three workers were working in non-engineering jobs. So I know that citizen science can be an opportunity for us to keep the STEM skilled, STEM interested people engaged and should always have pathways for people to return or enter the STEM workforce. I see opportunities such as offering, offering pathways for retired scientists to contribute. I'm gonna be there soon, so I'm looking forward to that. Provide reskilling pathways to those who may have ended up um, with uh, not having the job they wanted and finding a new pathway for their careers. Bringing out our latent workforce back into the fold. And a really good example of that is the STEM Returners Program, which was started last year and then building non-traditional pathways into science for the first time. So these are things which I think are really critical. But for us to be able to do that, we need to make sure that the science career pathway is accessible to everyone. So how can we do that? Because um, if you think of the fence as being the thing that's blocking people for a pathway, we often have the inequity where someone has an extra leg up and, uh, and a privilege and, um, and others are missing out. So therefore we want to have a equality where we give everybody a leg up, but that doesn't mean that everyone's in the same situation to be able to participate and see over the fence. So then we want to have equity where we give extra support to people so that they can participate. But I want to challenge the research sector to say, why do we even have to have the fence in the first place? How can we remove the barriers that we've created? Because we're the ones who made them. Why are we keeping citizen science out I want to see Australia inviting our citizen scientists in with access to publish research and research facilities. So ultimately, my vision for citizen science in Australia is one where citizen scientists have access to many of the same supports that your academic colleagues already have. Access to research, the ability to access Australia's scientific infrastructure and more opportunities for STEM careers to, be weave, in, to weave in and out so this is where I want to leave it today. Uh, and I hope that I've provoked a few ideas and I'm really looking forward to the discussion and seeing how we can cut out what we can do to really progress how citizen science becomes part of my army to really deliver what we need in Australia on the breadth of things, from whether it's new technology solutions for uh, addressing climate change, 
whether it's looking at biodiversity or a whole swag of other things, such as even just tweeting something so that you're actually able to add to the body of information uh, so that in real time, we're able to know what's going on and be able to predictively prepare for uh, some major event. So Lisa, back to you. And uh, thanks for giving me the chance to speak to you today. Hi, I thank you for that. That was an amazing keynote. Um, been a lot of reaction in the discussion forum, lots of inspiration. Um, people are very um, enthusiastic about the things you've been saying. Um, especially there's been a lot of chat about that open access uh, initiative, which is so important to citizen science. Um, we've got a question about um, what is the expected time frame for that open science initiative to roll out? Yeah, so we're just at the very stages. So I'm uh, at the moment testing the concept because it's pretty out there and very different to other designs for open access. So, uh, so, so far what we're doing is um, doing what we called a prospective analysis to just understand what are the barriers because I'm sort of breaking the system a little bit, well, a big bit, and it's going to require quite a um, disruption to be able to deliver on it. So uh, the time frame at this stage, I don't know. If you can think about the fact that we've got to negotiate with 1,700 publishers, that means that we're talking about quite a, a task and that there's also other things happening in the open access process and we need to make sure that we harmonise with them so that we roll this out in a certain way. So it's not going to happen overnight. I suspect it will take um, some time, um, you know, at least years. But uh, the thing that's really great is from the Prime Minister down, from even the publishers across the world there and also research academics, they're all very enthusiastic. And you can, and we've found too that industry in particular, uh, particularly our small to medium enterprises, see this as a very exciting opportunity for them. So I've got everyone saying yes. We're just going to work out how to navigate the system and work out. How, we're talking about very large sums of money, and we have to identify how we can um, get the funding together and use the funds in the system to be able to uh, to action it. But this is, as I said, step one, and um, and we'll progress it from there. But it's great to get your feedback that you are you think it's a good idea. Oh, yes. I think you'll get a lot of contacts from this audience that was uh, sharing that um, email address around in the discussion. Um, we've also had people looking up as, uh, every project that you've mentioned and posting links in the discussion forum as well. Um, and... We've got a couple of people in the discussion forum who've just mentioned the um, the UNESCO Open Science recommendations and how there's just recently been some great a great workshop about that. I was wondering if uh, you've got anything also to add about um, about open science. So that's really important. So open access is just the step one for open science, and just to explain, is at the moment uh, when it, well. When I, when I was you know, an early career researcher, you would do your work, you would publish your paper, but you kept most of your files in an Excel spreadsheet or in your own computer files. And, and there was no way other than people taking a published paper and measuring off with a ruler and stuff what the points are and trying to reproduce it in a pretty clunky and inaccurate way. And then trying, if, if you were tr especially if you're trying to build on that work or reproduce it. And if something was going wrong, then uh, or you couldn't reproduce it, it was pretty hard to sort of go and say, you know, I'm, I, is it me or is it you? What's going on here? And this and this is really critical for trust in science as well as making sure it's right. So uh, what Open Science is doing is is first of all saying, uh, can we make the data available? So that now there's a real push uh, and an expectation that publicly funded research should have the data available. Uh, may not it could be either on in a repository which is managed by the publisher, or quite often it's uh, uh, saying in the end of a research paper saying contact us if you want to access the data and we'll just send it through to you. We haven't got that sorted as a nice streamlined way, but it's uh, we're on a pathway to doing that. And I'll give you a really interesting example of where that made a big difference. So we have talked a little bit about quantum and quantum computing is something which is, I think, going to be changing all our lives within the next 10 years. And, um, and there's one technique 
which is uh, called topological insulators. And it's um, and it's the idea is that if we could crack that problem, it would it would make uh, 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 quantum computing uh, systems quite simple in comparison. But to do that, you need to be able to detect what's called um, um, Majorana fermions, which no one's ever detected before, and be able to control them. Now, the thing that's really interesting is that uh, Microsoft actually is doing a lot of work on this, both in Australia and in, in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands team thought they'd cracked the, pro the issue and, uh, and, and published a paper which was published in Nature, which was fantastic. And everyone's sort of saying, oh, possible Nobel Prize. And of course, the good thing was that people copied and, um, their technique and tried to reproduce it. And some researchers were ha just couldn't do get it to work. So they contacted the people uh, who did the original research and they shared their data. And the other group went through and, and actually challenged the way they had analyzed their data and found that there had been a misconception in the way the data had been analyzed. And so they went back and um, worked with that um, research group and they had to withdraw that paper because they found that they'd made a mistake. Now, some people say that's terrible, but actually for me, that is good science and we need to have more of it. And, um, and so that's, that open, that's the open, open, um, open data. And then the other aspect of open science is of course, um, uh, open access to research literature. And then there's another thing too, which is sort of an, a version of it, which is uh, having this idea of challenges. So, and the really good example of that at the moment, which I guess I've put out and is part of what you're doing here now is saying, we've got a 15% gap in um, how we're going to deal with our, um, our uh, ways of uh, abating uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we've got a 15% gap, we've got a fixed, and we've got 30, uh, 29 years to do that. So there's a real challenge there for all of us in Australia to, or, and the world to say, how can we think about what science can do to give us that solution? So how, what are the different ways people might be able to consider the, an approach to that? And can we actually have that challenge there as part of our um, collective vision so that when people are thinking about what research projects will I apply for funds for, this will be a focus for them. We sort of have a body of work focusing in the same area, pointing in the same direction. And that's when you solve big problems. And we probably saw with COVID um, last year, a perfect sort of example where uh, we had a, a global pandemic, which has, is still with us. And we had the whole research, the whole global research sector coming together to solve this. All papers that were published uh, for which were related to COVID were published open access by all journals. So that uh, that is um, that is something which uh, had never been done before. So that meant that everyone was able to see the same information. And you would have seen that normally it takes about twenty uh, ten to twenty years to develop a vaccine, and they were able to get that done in nine months. And that wasn't because they they uh, took cut corners or anything like that. It's because they had all the information at their hands and were able to share information quickly. And also, uh, quite often, the length of time it does take to uh, to develop a vaccine is because it's usually for a disease that's there's not much of it, and so the clinical trials take a very long time to get the statistics up to make sure that it's uh, that we've got the efficacy and the safety that we're looking for. And because there was so much COVID around in the globe that we were able to see those cl clinical trials happen quickly. But putting that all together meant that we were able to, as a, as a world, uh, have a pathway to really overcome and, um, and control the, the, the COVID pandemic. We're not there yet, but you know, just look at the headway we've made in this, such a short space of time. It is truly a, a miraculous um, achievement for humans to have done that and shows the ability of bringing things together and working together in a way which we don't tend to do. So I'm hoping that open science will see more of that happen. Oh, yes, definitely. I think this period of time with the pandemic has been such an eye-opening learning experience for what we are actually capable of, as well as in terms of getting the public more engaged and engaged in science rather than misinformation and pseudoscience. Um, We've got a, a question about, um, in terms of the open science, the UNESCO open science recommendations, um, how do you think citizen science can get a place at the table of policy planning in the response to that? 
because I think that's what we're all very interested in here. That's a really good point. So um, it's really interesting to see how uh, how do you influence in uh, and how do researchers influence? And so the first thing is having organisations such as your own, uh, which is really critical because uh, when you have, uh, you know, we, we are a democracy, which we should be really proud of. And we've got a very good, strong democracy with multiple layers. And, um, and, and science actually can enter in all the different layers from whether it's our local council, whether it's our state government or whether it's Commonwealth government. And, I th and what is, I think, I, often we don't realize is that uh, we, we have the power to actually, uh, and, and the opportunity, and I think the, um, the uh, requirement in some ways that we should be making sure that our elected politicians or our parliamentarians or our, our representatives are aware of the things that we're doing. And so if, I, I don't know if any of you, for example, have been involved with um, going to Science Meets Parliament, but that is often a very big eye opener for, um, for anyone who's worked in science to see how the political system works. And that is that quite often it's things such as going to your local member and letting them know about something that you're doing and raising it with them, or as a, um, a body that gives you uh, agency so that you're in a way able to uh, get, ask for a seat at the table, such as when there are um, science events on, that you have that um, recognition that we are a power that needs to be considered. And so it's actually believing in yourself, that's the first thing, being organised and having a clear message that is not saying um, entitled, I want, it's actually saying what value can I bring to help us as a nation to progress where we want to go to jointly and what I've got as a way to be able to, um, to, um, to make a difference. And I see someone said, I've been to local member, how do we ensure they follow up? It's one of those things which uh, squeaky wheel always works. So, and things where you've got to remember, you've got to play the long game in any of these things. When we've seen, even with my open access idea, we've got to play the long game and we've got to realise that this is not going to happen overnight. We've got to convince and bring everyone with us. But you just keep tapping away and you will, and so long as it's got coming from a position where you're I'm trying to able to make that value proposition. And it's not just I'm trying to sell you, you know, steak knives or use cars. It's actually the value proposition saying this work we're doing in citizen science is actually valuable. It's actually able to make a difference in this way and contribute. And you're getting, you know, a lot of input from people who are contributing their um, contributing their labor for free because it's 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 a citizen's thing but we're also having an impact so identifying how you can measure that impact is also really critical because that's you know just imagine if you're an elected body person you want to um you want to make sure that you're backing or supporting the things that have impact and i guess the other thing is uh all of you think about running for government <laughs> at all levels so we don't have enough scientists or people interested in science and really getting into it um who are who are our our elected representatives Yep. Ah, great. Um, so we also have um, a fair amount of discussion about your um, what you your uh, remarks about the STEM leaky pipeline, and um, and about your STEM returners the, the STEM returners program, which I think people are very interested in. Um, but also, I think what you were saying before about measuring the impacts and being able to demonstrate them, I think there's also the your huge potential within citizen science to impact that to that leaky pipeline to get people more engaged in um, science and in STEM. Um, and we've had a question about um, about what you think about getting younger people just more engaged in science generally and okay. into that pipeline. <laughs> oh sure, no! So um, if you just go into STEM returners, I think it's run through the. Um, uh, through the Engineers Australia, they, they definitely provide the um, mentoring. But in, if you just, I just quickly checked it. Then, if STEM Returners Australia into um, into into a Google, into a, a search engine, you'll it'll come up as the top one. So that's how you find it. Someone might want to find it, and pop it in the um, discussion forum. Um, so 
So there's a couple of things here. Let's start at the beginning of uh, encouraging young people. We need to have really clear um, what career pathways in, so which aren't just that, that limited one. At the moment, if you ask most people what it means to be a scientist or engineer, they really don't have a good idea. They think maybe you wear a white coat you, or you go out and build a bridge or there's not really a, 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 an understanding of what that means. And yet if you ask someone what a doctor or a lawyer does, they know straight away. Um, and even though if you know people who've done medicine and law, that they often don't end up working in medicine and law as a classic doctor or a lawyer, they often do a whole range of different, different jobs where they've been able to use their skills because their skills are very transferable. So when we often hear about saying, I don't know if you've heard this, where people say, oh, there's no jobs in STEM, they often think of it in terms of the very narrow career pathway into, um, into research academia in the university sector, which is very narrow. And, uh, and that's only a small proportion of people. For example, if we look at uh, just say people wanting to go and do a STEM course at a university, um, and we know that there's a whole lot of people we need in the vet area too, but I'm just looking at the university one because I have the numbers here. If you look at, a, say, 100 people who start a STEM uh, undergraduate degree, only 0 0.41 of them, that is not even one person, half a person will end up being a university professor in their career. So that's not a very good career pathway. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what people see and they think, oh, therefore there's no jobs. When in actual fact, uh, for I really need people to be working in the public service because government needs to be able to have um, science at the heart of all their policy development. And uh, we're seeing more uh, people with PhDs, with uh, science degrees, uh, STEM in general, mathematics, engineering, technology coming into the public service to help develop the policies and help our elected parliamentarians to be able to have the right policy settings so that we can be the society and the economy and the, and the prosperity that we want in this country. And as well as knowing how to engage internationally too. Um, and the same with, uh, if you look at business, if where all those um, industries I've pointed to, where are we going to find all those, you know, 240,000 uh, IT specialists in three years' time? We graduate about 6,000 uh, uh, IT specialists a year. So we've got a long way to go. And we can't just rely on, um, on, um, on my skilled migration, although that's a very important part. But if you look at, say, the number of women who are doing uh, IT, something like five or six percent, it's quite low. And yet if you go back, I don't know if you saw that fabulous movie called Hidden Figures uh, mm -hmm. about women uh, who were the human computers. Mo very early on, um, especially at the start of the space industry, and um, this was in the 50s, that um, women actually did a lot of the calculations because they're really good at it. And then eventually computing took over and you saw that end shift from women not being involved to it being a very male um, gendered uh, career. And the thing is we're missing out on a whole lot of uh, people who are, as you're saying, embracing our full human potential. We're not actually creating the opportunity for, for uh, that. So we could double the number straight away pretty much if we had equal numbers of women and men in, in um, doing IT so, so they're the sorts of things we need to think about is that career pathways, thinking about where could I get a job at the end? Because most people, you know, when they're choosing subjects at school, they're a mixture of what they like and also a mixture of, um, which is where you guys come in and in inspiring young people. But also, um, you know, they do want to, young people do about the future. They do want to get into something where they know they have a job and that they can be welcomed. And that's where we have to make sure, and that's the next thing, which is, we have people training and yet we lose them with that leaky pipeline. And there's a couple of things there. Um, a long time ago, I was president of the Australian Institute of Physics. And I asked a friend of mine who I went to university with why he wasn't a, a member. And he said, well, I work in private sector. And when I am engaging with people in the research sector, I always feel like I'm a loser or I've lost out. And it's just too depressing. And I think that's part of our problem is that uh, we feel it's almost like we've got this culture here where um, 
you're not a STEM professional unless you're working in a lab in a white, you know, in a university sector. When actually, I really believe you're a STEM professional so when you've got any training or interest and you're actually act, uh, involved in using those skills somehow. And, um, and that we should be proud and loud about the sorts of things which are beyond the research academia. Um, that's one thing. The second is that how we decide what is good and who gets the jobs is very much des designed on a very narrow range of uh, parameters such as publication numbers, citations. It doesn't take into account a whole range of other things that are needed to demonstrate excellence as being a researcher. And these need to be considered and this would impact a whole range of things. It would mean that women and uh, people from minority groups would immediately have greater opportunity. But the other is also that it would mean that if we had a broader range of, of um, what does good look like, it would allow people to move around the sector more. Because at the moment, you sort of get stuck in one silo, like public funded agency, CSRO, uh, university, industry, government, and there's not a lot of movement. But we're beginning to see some change, which is pretty exciting. And I hope we can do more of that. And then the other one is too, we have to make sure that we are supporting everyone in when they're at work. And this isn't just in STEM, this is in work in general. I think we've actually designed the system to be based on that sort of 50s idea that we've got someone at home looking after life and someone out working. And, um, and now we've got a point where everyone works because we need to. And also it's quite enriching. And uh, But the thing is, that means we, we've we still got that old fashioned design of work, which means that if something goes wrong, wrong like a sick child and um, an, a, an elderly parent, the fridge not working, uh, you know, sort of having a bad hair day. I mean, all the sorts of things which we know actually impacts our work uh, needs to be dealt with at the workplace. And up till now, we've not done that, although we're seeing some changes. Uh, I think, for example, just I think this year they've just introduced in some, I don't know the details of it, but miscarriage leave for women who've had miscarriages, which is very, very uh, common thing. Uh, we've seen through the pandemic, the realization that, uh, and this has impacted women more than men uh, because they've taken on the greater load of, of um, looking after their, uh, or teaching their children at home. But we can see that, um, that we've been able to manage a whole new way of working. We need to capture that amplify it and see how we can put it into the way we just operate in all our workplaces so that it allows the whole range of things that happen because no one has a perfect life everything goes wrong you know just about in any workplace there's always someone who's got something going on because that's life and we need to redesign the way we have our work system and what we're seeing though is because that's not accepted generally we're losing people along the way for a range of different reasons and we've got to really rethink how we actually support women in particular, but everyone, um, particularly in those early careers. But actually, when you look at it, it's all the way through. There's always something. Yeah, uh, I feel like you're speaking directly to me. I, I originally, as I said, did my degree in physics and thought I would follow the pathway to be an astronomer. But then by the end of it, decided, was a little discouraged because of the lack of representation of women and, and just the obstacles that you talk about. So ended up working in um, animation and games and being and a lot of people with physics degrees end up as technical artists in, on big movies and things like that. And that oh, was absolutely. And that is a fantastic career pathway. We should celebrate it. And it's hidden. And, I, and it, you know, who, who would love to be a, a physicist working on uh, as a as a consultant or designing whatever it is with the, uh, entertainment? How, I mean, you know, we all know that's hugely influential and can getting it right and making it sure that, you know, we have the, the science right when we're, we're looking at some of those um, movies and entertainment are, are absolutely critical. It's actually a new way of teaching people. So, yeah, that, and we should, I think that's a problem. We go back and we look at how do we measure and celebrate what people are doing and it's often in a ve very narrow areas. Yep. And um, we also have one of our members here, um, commenting that you know she's a, a forensic chemist and right now she's at home with a sick child and getting a fridge delivered because her fridge just died yesterday <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a lot of people here that you've been speaking directly to with a lot of with your um comments about that oh, wow. um 
just let, just remember that everybody every, every yeah i always look for someone who's never had anything go wrong in their life and uh uh <laughs> they don't exist so you know we're all humans together and i think we need to recognize that yeah wonderful um i think we we ha still have a couple of minutes um uh i just think everyone's really been uh, responding really well to your talk today. Um, and we'd just really like to thank you. I wanted to just quickly add. Well, I guess just the first thing is I'm just thrilled to have been invited today. And I really want to encourage the Citizen Science um, Initiative. And uh, I can see some of the, I hope that we can save some of the chat here and the, and the yeah. discussion because I'd love to work my way through that so that uh, we can understand it better because it is important. It's, I think we should be um, seeing you know, and making it visible and, and doing more celebration of it. And that's something has got, I've got some ideas which I'm going to follow up on, but it's, uh, it's um, I know, for example, there's a, a Eureka Prize on citizen science. And I, I think that's something which i uh, thinking, well, we need to celebrate those things, but what are other citizen science prizes and recognition? Uh, and also, as you said, if we're if there's a need to get information in, into um, recognition uh, by by various forms of government, then we need to work out what that message is and, and make sure that we share it. So you're not just selling it yourself, but you get the academies, other uh, professionals and general public and businesses are actually speaking on your behalf because that can also be very powerful. Yeah, no, it's it's an ongoing um a journey in the advocacy part of what we do and um, lots of people learning and 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 um, and trying to work out exactly yeah who do, how do we make the most impact and um, and what are our strat strategies around that because I think a lot of us come to citizen science we have no idea about how to do those things we're just very passionate about what we do so um, we very much appreciate uh, your advice about strategies and I'm sure uh, we would love to have an ongoing dialogue with you about that. Um, so yeah, thank you again. Um, we really appreciate uh, you coming here for this keynote today. Um, I'm, you will get a lot of contact about the open access uh, project. I will. I will <laughs> Fantastic. And, and as Very I said, there's some really great questions. I can see Graham Durand asking about reimagining research funding there's a whole range of things there yes. where I think we're at a moment in time where there's an appetite to say, can we rethink the way science is done? And it's a bit scary to think about it, but I think now's the time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. Bye, everyone. Bye. <clears throat>